is a topic that we uh, that's that's a topic that we that was brought up among others by um, by Rosemary, who was also here in the meeting. Because as we as we discussed or co-designed our first kind of research projects within our network plus, it became clear that we have some people have a narrower understanding of what we are working on, others have a wider understanding. And I think for kind of reasons of understanding where we are coming from and how we approach our research projects, it's important um, to talk about this. Ah. Claudia, not just that, it's good to know, why is it? See. Okay, I can speak in the in kind of the general channel. Is that better, Claudia? Somehow the interpreter didn't hear me. Uh, no, debes, debes hablar en el inglés porque si no no te van a escuchar todos. Sí, estuve en el de inglés. Is this is this okay now? I was in the English channel. Yeah, okay, super, should I just start again? Sorry about that. So um, um, so first session of the new year, um, we are going to talk about the um, kind of overlaps and differences between unarmed civilian protection, civil resistance, and uh, human rights defense. Um, to clarify where we are coming from um, uh, on these topics in our research. So we are really happy to have Christina here today because Christina has so many different experiences with unarmed civilian protection. Um, on the one hand, Christina works um, among other things for the Federation for Social Defense in Germany and also has been working with the Institute for Peacework and Nonviolent Conflict Transformation in Germany. She uh, has done unarmed civilian protection work herself as, a, as an accompanier um, in, during the wars in the Balkans in the 1990s. Um, she has been working with nonviolent peace force um, quite a bit, so kind of has really looked at this topic from very many different perspectives. And she's also an academic who looks at these questions um, in her research. Um, so, Christina, I just hand over to you. If I've forgotten anything crucial about your CV, please add yourself. Um, and otherwise, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. No, I don't think you've uh, forgot anything important. I would like to share my screen. And perhaps the interpreters could tell me if they understand me. I'm also speaking through the English channel at the moment. Understood there was a problem. Okay, I can hear you perfectly well. Thank you so okay, much. Okay. Okay, great. So then let me start. Um, I was told I would uh, have about uh, 20 minutes. And so what I'm trying to do is that I look at these three different fields. So which I just will call now unarmed civilian protection and if you use other terms for it, like civilian peacekeeping or accompaniment and so on, then just please translate it to UCP or UCP to your term. Civil resistance is the second and human rights defense, the third one. So let me first start with three uh, short definitions. Um, so unarmed, uh, UCP, unarmed uh, civilian protection and so on, uh, refers to the protection of civilians from violence and conflict situations for unarmed civilians. These are present locally and use a variety of tools to prevent violence and protect people. This can be performed, and I think that's important to stress, by international as well as domestic civilians. So it's not necessarily something that internationals only do working abroad, but it's also done at home or communities or individuals protecting each other or themselves. So this is important. You'll realize later on in this uh, conversation. Uh, that's the definition I used that's used by nonviolent peace force. Others use slightly different uh, definitions, but the core is really that it's about protection from violence by people who are unarmed themselves and are present on the ground. The protection from what kind of violence, I mean, this is a very long list and probably I forgot a few, it can be organized armed actors, soldiers, militias, police in some cases, death squads, then protesters, mobs, 
violent members of other communities, be it ethnic or religious communities. Criminal violence is an issue. Corporate violence, uh, often using private security firms uh, to repress uh, opposition or protests against building or mining or uh, building of water uh, resources, etc. Blood feuds, some organizations work on, and uh, some also look at domestic violence. Not everyone, I think this is a little bit of a debated issue, domestic violence should also be a topic of UCP or not. Uh, there are at least uh, 50 civil organizations currently that are doing this kind of work. Uh, this we have found in the uh, Good practice process of nonviolent peace force, which I think most of you are familiar with, if I understand the setting of this research cafe. So I don't need to explain. Uh, this was a series of workshops where we invited different organizations, both local and international ones. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's a very wide variety of approaches and experiences. And uh, this is another controversial item, perhaps. Uh, if there are also unarmed governmental missions like uh, OSCE, for example, that are also doing something that could be called UCP. I would say yes. Others also in Nova Peace Force, for example, are a bit more doubtful about that. So this was a very short definition about unarmed civilian protection. I hope that was enough for this circle. Otherwise, you will just need to ask or we can come back to it in the discussion. Civil resistance or nonviolent resistance is another thing that has different terms. Uh, some also speak of nonviolent revolutions uh, or simply of uh, uh, nonviolent action and so on. I use here the term civil resistance. And what it means, I'm using here a definition by the US researcher Erica Chenoweth. Uh, so now civil resistance is a method of active conflict in which unarmed people use a variety of coordinated non-institutional methods, strikes, protests, demonstrations, boycotts, alternative institution building, and many other tactics to promote change without harming or threatening to harm an opponent. Important here are the non-constitutional methods in this definition, because otherwise you could say that any legal demonstration or voting going to elections, of course, is also unarmed or nonviolent, uh, but it would not count as civil resistance. What needs to be distinguished in my eyes, and it's sometimes not really from me not reflected well enough in the literature, is that uh, there is resistance on the one hand involving the whole society. So, but Chenoweth and Stevens uh, distinguished regime change, recession, and social defense or uh, resistance against, uh, uh, yeah, against, uh, oh, God, now the word is missing. Uh, so when you are against occupation, I think they use another term. Uh, so this is the whole where the whole society is somehow involved. But then you also have nonviolent action to change certain projects or policies or programs or remove certain politicians, uh, but without questioning the fundamentals of the current regime. So all the protests against uh, nuclear waste or against nuclear plants or against atomic weapons and so on, they also but there's also a lot of nonviolent action in these, but uh, they are at a much more limited, the objectives are much more limited and sometimes also the number of people that engage in it are limited, but not necessarily. There are, have also been nonviolent actions, for example, against nuclear weapons in the 1980s where really many, many thousands were involved in. So, so far about civil resistance and after I've not, then come to uh, human rights work, I'll try to bring the three together. So human rights defense work, I think that's the one where most people have a very instinctive idea what it is about. And I think these instincts usually also are right. The human rights defender, I've here just copied a definition by uh, the UN, by the High Commissioner for Human Rights, for, uh, yeah, for, for human rights. Uh, it's a term that describes human rights defenders is a term to describe people who act or promote or protect human rights in a peaceful manner. And then there are some principles uh, like you, that human rights are for everyone and everywhere. Uh, it may have local, national, regional, international, international action. Uh, 
has to do with collecting and disseminating information, protecting victims of human rights violations, uh, actions to end impunity, uh, supporting or doing advocacy for better governance and so on. Uh, then the implementation of human rights treaties is another topic. And then of course, human rights education and training both with uh, children, but also with adults, is also a very important fact. So these are the three fields. Um, so how, what does this have to do with protection or with unarmed civilian protection? So the first step I would like to take here, or that I, I took when preparing this, uh, uh, this uh, presentation was that I had a look at different handbooks and literature on civil resistance uh, to see, is there anywhere mention of what we call unarmed civilian protection? Or is there protection just as such a topic? So I found in the regard to human rights work uh, that there are many web pages and handbooks and probably you also, at least those of you who are active in the field will be familiar with one or the other uh, about how what human rights defenders do, how you do your documentation and so on, but there's also usually uh, the question of security and how to protect yourself and your data and so on as part of these handbooks. Um, I've just uh, got here two web pages where you can find such resources. One is from Frontline Defenders and the other from Protection International. Uh, both have published a number of handbooks themselves. And then the first uh, from Frontline Defenders, you will also find uh, handbooks produced by the UN, by the European Union, and many, many other people who are doing these kind of handbooks. These manuals are usually dealing with self-protection. So they give advice how to, how to protect yourself. I've almost nowhere found uh, unarmed civilian protection or protective accompaniment mentioned in these handbooks, with a very few ex exceptions and then only usually in a few sentences. Maybe I overlooked something. I cannot claim that I've looked at all the material that's available, but I have not found any handbook that says, well, if you are a human rights defender organizations, uh, organization and you are threatened by death squads, uh, consider asking this or that organization to organize protective accompaniment, which might be useful advice, for, although of course maybe the uh, it's not that easy if you are such an organization then to really convince another a protective, uh, an organization active in protection we need to come to you. That's another question given the limited resources. But it's, um, you can find, uh, uh, yeah, maybe you find it mentioned, but I, I couldn't really find anything. Then, okay, there's also, there's something one handbook about protection from afar, which I was involved uh, with in writing about. Uh, that handbook uh, was written for activists in Turkey, where we have the situation that many people, even citizens from other countries, but with Turkish roots, are arrested when they visit in Turkey and write something bad in Facebook about the president, and suddenly they are arrested. And so we did a handbook to advise their families or friends or support groups what to do to help people in such situations of arbitrary arrest. Um, this is also not of UCP as such, because UCP, one element of UCP is that you are on the ground and that's not the case in Turkey. Uh, but uh, that's a handbook that uh, yeah, deals with what third parties can do to protect people. Okay, so let me come to the next, uh, to civil resistance and nonviolent action. There are also many handbooks uh, written mostly by some organizations uh, that are advising, giving training, doing research on civil resistance. Uh, one is the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict, Canvas, that is a Serbian organization uh, that was founded uh, during the, or after the uh, resistance against President Milosevic in the 1990s. 2001, Milosevic uh, was toppled and then this organization was founded. The Albert Einstein Institution uh, is the institution that was founded by Gene Sharp. Maybe one or the other of you have heard his name for his 
basic research on nonviolent action. They also have, they're still existent. Gene Sharp himself, himself doesn't live anymore, but they are still active and produce also, or at least uh, link new materials. Nonviolence International is another international organization with a page on resources. Raw Resistance International is a nonviolent anti militarist network that also has some resources on civil resistance. There are many handbooks, uh, training handbooks, uh, and etc. And at least some of them address the issue of self protection and how to deal with massive violence, at least a little bit. Uh, what uh, unarmed civilian, what concerns unarmed civilian resistance as uh, a protection, sorry, that's rarely mentioned in these resources, uh, with one exception that is this monograph that you can see here that's written, I think, also again by Elka Chenoveth. Uh, she has a paragraph on unarmed civilian protection when she lists different uh, ways how to protect yourself when you are engaged in civil resistance. But basically, the picture is not that much different from the picture on human rights defense while threats, security are big issues. Obviously, unarmed civilian protection has not really fully entered the literature on these in these fields uh, as much as I think it might deserve. I come now to the comparison. So that's the third step after having introduced first these three uh, things on civil resistance, UCP, and human rights defense, and then looking at what role protection plays. So these are now, that's a page now showing commonalities and differences between uh, the three issues that I could think of, and perhaps, in, or probably in the discussion, we will find more elements, or, or maybe you also have concerns about some of the things. Human rights as to goals. I would say for human rights work, the basic goals are to prevent human rights violations, to protect from human rights violations, and to restore justice. For civil resistance, uh, there may be different goals, depending, as I said, depending on the case and what the objectives are. It may be regime change, it may be sec secession, it may be anti-occupation, Palestine, for example, but it may also be to prevent or stop laws, projects by governments or corporations, or also protests against opponent groups in the own society. If you think of the demonstrations against right-wing groups uh, or Nazis that we have nowadays in many European countries. As to unarmed civilian protection, I would say the basic goals are to protect civilians. That's the terminology some organizations use or activists or communities and of course also to prevent violence. As to the principles, I think for human rights work, the most basic principles are again, nonviolence, at least in the, not in the very loaded uh, way of nonviolence as a way of life or philosophy, but just very practically, usually uh, people who use arms to fight for their objectives uh, are not considered human rights defenders uh, whenever you look at international norms, etc. Orientation on legal framework, I think is very important as a principle for human rights work and impartiality, so that you do not report only about the human rights violations of one side, uh, but you look at the human rights violations as violations, whoever has committed them. For civil resistance, could only think of nonviolence as a very basic principle. There may be others I just couldn't generate in my own brainstorm at my computer. As the UCP, uh, this good practice uh, project, uh, Nonviolent Peace Force did elicited actually a number of more principles than these three that I'm listing here nonviolence, often on partisanship, not every, all the times, and primacy of local actors. That means if you're an international organization, that you're guided by local people and their needs and do what they want you to do and not that the agenda setting is for the locals and not for you as international. Of course, if you're yourself in a local organization, uh, this third principle doesn't make sense. As to actors, in bold, uh, those I think are most important. For human rights work, I would say all the different levels uh, and forms of organizing are 
equally important. You have individual human rights defenders, you have local groups, you have NGOs and INGOs, but you also have governments and you have international organizations like the UN, the African Union, OSC, and so on. They are also engaging in human rights. As the civil resistance, I would say the primary actor are social movements. But of course, you also have civil society organizations, international solidarity groups, governments, uh, etc. And as to UCP, you have INGOs and net international networks, uh, you have local groups and community, and you also have, I forgot here the list, but uh, yeah, just national groups that work in their own country or maybe in one or two of neighboring countries. So, are focusing on one particular conflict. So this is, I think when you compare this, there's quite a lot of overlap between the three, although they are not identical. What are the intersections? Uh, and this is already my last real slide other than the final one with a, some nice quote from Gandhi. So the intersections um, between unarmed civilian protection, human rights defenders, I would say one, and that's very obvious, and that's um, also, I think, how much of the UCP work started, accompaniment of human rights defenders. There were opening space so that they can do their work. The example would be the accompaniment in Latin America, for example, as Peace Brigades International has been doing for more than 40 years by now, uh, that they focused on their main, the pe people they're mostly working with are human rights defenders and human rights defending defenders groups. Uh, they also work with local communities, but uh, the yeah, accompaniment of HRDs is really the very important uh, point here. And of course, well, the other intersection I can see is that international human rights laws and conventions are a reference body for unarmed civilian protection activities that when you are asked so uh, why are you doing this or what's your problem uh, with this or that, then you can, organizations very often point to these bodies of international human rights laws uh, to justify and uh, their actions and also to find support by third parties, by governments and so on. The intersection between human rights and civil resistance. Um, I think one is, that human rights violations are often an issue in the conflict. So for example, in Belarus, or if you look at indigenous movements against land grabbing and so on there, the human rights violations themselves are maybe at least the cause, maybe the cause, but at least one factor in the struggle that for example in Belarus, uh, it was not only the that, uh, the elections were rigged uh, in 2020, but that afterwards so many people were arrested, that people were mistreated in prisons, uh, uh, that there was torture and so on, which became a, almost a bigger topic than the elections themselves. They went to the background almost. Then, of course, uh, another point are human rights violations as a threat to activists that you have also very, very often that human rights defenders are not safe, that they are threatened. Uh, uh, and not only human rights defenders are threatened, but also activists. I mean, I just mentioned the example of Belarus. And then sometimes also that documentation of human rights uh, violations is used to win international support. I remember, for example, a human rights organization in Kosovo uh, that is a at that time was the province uh, of the former Yugoslavia in Europe in the 1990s, there was nonviolent resistance and there was uh, one group that documented human rights violations and they, whenever you came as an international visitor to their office, the first thing you had to do was to look at pictures they had taken from people who had been uh, beaten up by the police. Uh, this was well known and not everybody who visited them was very happy about these uh, pictures, but uh, you had to go through this uh, ritual almost before you really could sit down and discuss on what to do. So this is often also one element of human of civil resistance that human rights violations documentation is uh, used for this purpose. And I'm civilian protection, civil resistance. Um, 
monitoring, escorting, mediation, documentation, or all things that unarmed civilian protectors do in cases of civil resistance movements. There is a difference, and I mentioned already this issue about nonpartisanship, that this is not for everyone a big principle. Uh, you have organizations that are very clear that they stand on the side, that they watch, for example, police behavior to see if there are human rights violations, but uh, they do not in any way engage or but is they are very careful not to be seen participating in the civil resistance, while other organizations understand their work a little bit different. Uh, for example, Christian peacemaker teams, for them, the central term is to undo oppression, as they call it, and they would not hesitate also to be in a demonstration unless there are other practical reasons not to be, not to do so. Uh, so this is this point about the challenge to organizations for the nonpartisan approach that uh, it, how to keep a part and still be useful and still be uh, serving this purpose of protecting people. General, I think for all these, th all the three ones, um, of course, there's an civilian protection by local communities. So when they do it, it doesn't even really matter if they uh, would say that we are primarily engaged in civil resistance or engaged in human rights defense or just uh, trying to be a zone of peace uh, and to stay out of war. Uh, is, in that case, there's really a very strong overlap and I think it almost cannot be distinguished from what I described earlier as the methods of protection. No, I didn't describe it, but I mentioned that there are these, all these methods of protection by local people for their own work. And the other general thing is that actors of unarmed civilian protection offer trainings uh, in self-protection measures. I know that I think maybe not everyone, but most of the organizations that would count as mystic organizations are engaged in such trainings for at least two reasons. One is uh, to have to do, be sustainable in their efforts so that uh, it doesn't protection doesn't depend on the presence of the international maybe international organization that but people can continue uh, also after the internationals have left uh, so as a measure of an exit strategy or for a case that uh, the secu security situation deteriorates so much that internationals are not allowed anymore uh, or just as a very principled thing that it uh, they try to uh, seek just so they see the local communities have developed already things and maybe we can support them to do this to even develop some more tactics or better tactics and so on. So that's already the last was the last real slide. Um, I like this quote by Gandhi. Uh, so he said, we are constantly being astonished these days at the amazing discoveries in the field of violence, but I maintain that far more undreamt of and seemingly impossible discoveries will be made in the field of nonviolence. And I think as in regard to unarmed civilian protection, this certainly is also true now 60 years after he said that, because I think there are many possibilities to link unarmed civilian protection to these other fields, to civil resistance, to human rights defense, that have barely, I mean, I think UCP actors might be aware of it, but from the other side, I think there is still uh, a long way to go maybe. Thank you.